Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The baptism was um, a particularly personally um, happy moment for me. Long ago, um, my father and Louisa's great-grandfather, who's Warren Kaysen, uh, were fraternity brothers together at the University of Florida. Before either Louisa or I were a twinkle in our parents' eyes at all. And um, while today in glory they may be grieving the Gators' loss, I can't help but think they also are looking down with affection and happiness uh, to see the faith pass from generation to generation. And it certainly feels like the fellowship of believers, the communion of saints gathered around for me. But I want to focus on verse 33 from the gospel reading where Jesus says, you're setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. You are setting your mind. What will you set your mind on this week? What will you set your mind on? My wife, Emily, is an evangelist for the GPA, GPS system Waze. Anybody familiar with Waze? There's a number of GPS navigating systems, I know that, but she's an evangelist for Waze. And this week, we were headed to a dinner engagement, and we were going out to Brandon, and um, as we headed towards the car, she said, if you'll navigate, I'll drive. And I said, okay, I kind of like navigating anyhow. And then we started down Himes because we were going to Brandon, and I, before um, we went very far, knew I wanted us to go to the Crosstown. And she said, turn on Waze too, will she? What kind of a deal is that? I was supposed to navigate, and she's advocating for the app before we get down Himes. But because I'm dutiful, I did. And nevertheless, I said, pull up here on the Crosstown, and we did. And the voice on Waze started saying, exit onto De Leon Street. And that didn't seem right to me. <laughs> it was about 5.30, and I knew driving through downtown Tampa, trying to get the 60 to go out to Brandon, was going to be a slog through traffic. So I said to Emily, we're not going to do that. We're going to keep going to Crosstown over. And she said, you should listen, John. Waze is updated in real time. It gets traffic alerts, there may be an accident up ahead, or maybe a truck has spilled its contents and we could come to a grinding halt here and be really late. And we're coming up on De Leon now. And I'm saying, keep going, we're gonna go the cross down. <laughs> I trust my intuition there rather than the real time intelligence of the hive. And you know what? This time we went through fine, all right? And, and I tried not to gloat about it. Now, I'm going to come back to that in a moment, all right? But Emily said to me, even as we moved past De Leon, she looked at me and she said, trust the ways, John. Trust the ways. The gospel text this morning shows up in the life of the worshiping community very often. Um, we get it a disproportionate number of times in our suggested readings, and it has several um, verses in it that make it really critical in the gospel, that make it in many ways at the heart of the gospel. Amongst them are uh, the line where Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. That line alone means we get it not only in the cycle of readings that take us through now into the life of Jesus across the fall, but often in Lent because of the cross theme. We'll get it a second time, take up your cross and follow me. And I've preached that Lenten theme before. From this text, I've preached the question of how we take up our crosses and what does that mean to follow at this point. It shows up a lot also because it's in multiple gospels. Mark and Matthew have almost verbatim this account here. So it's obvious that this is a story that's deep in the life of the Christian community as they heard it from different sources and remembered it about Jesus. And in it, it has the, the great question that Jesus asked them. He starts by asking, who do the people say that I am? And they answer, some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist, others one of the prophets. And then Jesus says to them, who do you say that I am? 
And we all receive that question, don't we? Whether you answer it or don't answer it, there's the question. Who is Jesus to you? For you here today, who is Jesus for you? Peter answers with an excellent word. You are the Messiah, he says. You are, in Greek, the Christ, the anointed one, connecting with the long Hebrew scripture history of the one that God sends to save God's people and to lead God's people. You are the anointed one. You are the Messiah. It's, it's like it's parallel declaration. You are the Lord. And sometimes in preaching, I've examined that phrase from this text. But today we consider a different question, and one that I think is eminently practical, and that's the question, what does it mean for Christians to set your mind? Because that's what Jesus says to Peter here when he's trying to get him to do the right thing. He says, set your mind, Peter, on divine things, God's intentions, and not worldly or human things. Well, what does it mean to set your mind? How do we do that? This is practical counsel for faithfully following Jesus from Jesus himself. So set your mind now towards the phrase. When Peter answers with, you are the Messiah, Jesus immediately in Mark begins to teach that the Son of Man must now undergo great suffering and be rejected by leaders and also be killed and after three days rise again. But that rise again clause doesn't seem to have been heard over the traumas of the first three clauses there, rejected and killed and suffer. It must not have been heard because Peter, the text says, took Jesus, Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Consider those words. Those words took him and rebuked him. Both verbs, to take and to rebuke, express superiority and authority. Take him implies here taking him aside to instruct him or taking aside to care for as one would care for a child or an invalid. And rebuke is a word Jesus himself is often used in the Gospels and will again. It's the word he often uses to command demons. He rebukes them. It's the word he speaks when he stills the storm and tells it to be quiet. He rebukes it. He speaks it here to his disciples, and he often speaks it to those in authority. Rebuke is sometimes appropriately, I think, in Mark translated to command or to change. It's also used sometimes by Jesus to command silence. He rebuked them into silence. But rebuke is the word that Peter brings to bear on Jesus immediately after confessing him as Messiah. To call someone Messiah or Christ, the anointed one, means you're giving up your right to correct them or dictate them because they are the anointed one of God, the leader, the Lord. It's hypocritical or ignorant to call someone Messiah and then to take them aside to rebuke them. The question is here in this text, who's in charge? Peter tries to behave, I think, benevolently. That's my read on it. He's trying to act benevolently here because he actually thinks he knows better. He should check that. Peter is acting like he's Jesus' patron. I wonder if Peter was older than Jesus. You think he was just a little older? He's not behaving like a disciple here, but he's behaving a bit like a well-meaning and a little bit arrogant older brother. But Jesus will not be patronized. The flow of the text moves here from the question, who is Jesus, to the question, what does it mean to be Jesus' disciple? Peter and us, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? And that's the difference between God and the GPS, you see. I told you I'd come back to it. With a GPS, you punch into it where you want to go, and it shows you the best route to get there, even as events may change like traffic jams or mudslides around you. But it's taking you where you've told it you want to go. It can change events based on real time. But with God, you don't punch in, here's where I want to go. You follow. You, to use what Jesus says here in Mark, you set your mind 
on God's intentions. The verb set your mind is, is one word in Greek. The verb set your mind is a rich term philosophically. It's already well used in Greek thought. It means a kind of reflective wisdom to, to turn your mind towards something based on wisdom, your intelligence and your experience, and to reflect on it as you think about it. I like, I actually like the way, it may be more accurate, that the King James Version translates this about this verb. It says, savor the things of God. What does it mean to savor, to savor in your mind, to consider, to envision, to hold in your thought, to orient yourself toward? Can you do that with respect to divine things in your mind? in your heart, to reflect on them, to envision them, to become more aware of them? The problem is not Peter's confession, you are the Christ, that's an excellent word. It's Peter's trusting what he just declared to shape the direction. When we got to where we were going, I took the Waze app on her phone and went into the settings section. And sure enough in there, for some reason, the setting saying avoid interstates had been clicked on. And that's why it was telling me to get off the cross town, to get me off the interstate, all right? Listen, you cannot have your own a priori settings in following Jesus. You can't said to block out, you can't ask God, you can't set God to block out from your journey anything uncomfortable or hard. Because the journey with God may need your courage it may need your persistent, hard-working effort. Now, here's a question that I find helpful as a savoring question. Each day, it's best for me if I can ask it before my feet hit the ground when I get out of bed. A savoring question for each situation, too. A recalibrating question, to use the GPS language. Here it is. What does faithfulness look like now? For me, in that morning, what does faithfulness look like? In the hour ahead, what does it look like to be faithful? Across this week, what does it look like to be faithful? Here's this Sunday's takeaway, verse 33. Set your mind on divine things. You can't control which thoughts show up in your head, in your heart. You can't, you can't keep at bay any negative thought or any bad thought. They show up, don't they, like birds. So if you saw across a day all of the thoughts that show up in my head, you'd be, I'd be embarrassed about it. I would want to say, throw that GPS out the window, John. You can't control which thoughts show up in your head or heart across the day, but you can control which ones you invite to stay and make a nest there, and raise a family in your life. What will you set your mind on this week? And may God add God's blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word.